Super. Um, so hello and welcome everyone to Maximising Memberships for Arts and Cultural Organisations. My name is Marina Jones and I'm Deputy Development Director at ENO. This is a session which is part of the Chartered Institute of Fundraising, part of the RAISE Network, which is the Culture Sector Network Support and funded by Arts Council England. Um, so we've done all the funding credits because that's always really important as fundraisers and there'll be some more things around that as we go through today. Uh, so first we thought we'd start with some introductions so you know who's talking to you and why you should perhaps listen to some of the things we've got to say uh, and where we come from. Um, I'm Marina Jones, I've been at e &O now for 16 months. Before that I was at the Royal Opera House as Head of Membership and Appeals. Uh, but also working in legacies, trust and foundations and various other bits and pieces and capital campaigns. Before that, I've been at the Lyric Hammersmith, the Orange Tree Theatre and Polka Theatre. So my whole career has been in arts fundraising and membership and how we look after supporters has always been a really important part of what I do. And I'm delighted that I'm joined by Dominic, who is Head of Philanthropy at e &O, who will tell you a bit about him. Hello. Yeah, I've been at English National Opera, similar time to Marina, 16, 18 months. Um, I came from uh, Head of Development at English Touring Opera uh, and before that uh, was in the same role, Head of Development at Spitalfields Music uh, and before that was a, a producer, independent producer and producer for companies like the King's Head Theatre, Opera Close, etc. Great. Uh, so um, we're going to start with just a big question. If membership didn't exist for your organisation, would it be necessary to invent it? And Rosario is going to pop a little poll up that you can get to, to vote on. Um, and while you're doing that, just a few bits of housekeeping. If you've got any questions for me and Dominic as we go through, if you can put those in the Q&A. And if you just want to chat to other people or kind of go, oh, that was interesting, or what about this, uh, then put it in the chat. If you've got any questions for Rosario, uh, who's sort of behind the scenes, making sure everything works, then do that. Uh, if you want to just message Dominic privately because you've got a question you don't want to ask in front of a big group, then please just drop him a, a private message and he'll bring that into the Q&A as we go through. Um, so great. So yes, mo most people think yes, um, which is good because that's why we're all here to talk about membership. Uh, but it's an interesting don't know and knows also come up as well. Thank you. Um, oh, and I'll show the results so you can see them. There we go. Okay. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to say, why do people become members? What do they want from their membership? How do you promote their membership? And how do you bring them closer? And we're going to go for poll two now, Rosario, which is what is your biggest challenge with membership? And if you can just answer that uh, as well. Cool, we've got poll one. If we can have poll two, please. There we go. Thank you. Right, I'll give that a few more seconds as we go on. Okay, so we wanted to talk about the size of the UK membership market. It's uh, it's enormous. Uh, every householder in the UK spends about £552 a year on different types of membership. The whole market is worth about £323 million, um, but there's obviously a lot of players within that, and arts and cultural membership are just probably a small piece of the membership uh, question that people are involved in. Right, I'm going to end that poll and share the results with you. Uh, so we can see getting new members, keeping current members, well, a little bit of everything. Uh, what's the highest? So getting new members is the highest, followed by the age of our membership. Um, and also keeping and yeah, keeping current members, gift aid and VAT headaches, which we'll be touching on as we go through the session um and internal challenges so thank you for doing that and now we're going to go with poll three um which is how many levels of membership do you currently have 
with a very interesting option of not quite sure off the top of my head, um, which perhaps speaks to some of uh, the questions that we have um, as an organisation and the way that membership involves for us. And how important is membership to you in your organisation? What percentage of your fundraised income does it bring in? What percentage of your ticket revenue does it bring in? Who is it really for and why is it really important? At ENO, about 15% of our annual ticket spend comes from the members of part of the organisation. At the Opera House, it's a lot more. It's a really crucial part of our fundraising income and that's why it's important to us as fundraisers but uh, it's always important to understand the history of where the organisations come from. In a lot of arts and cultural organisations, uh, friends and membership started off as separate charities set up by really dedicated people who wanted to have uh, additional access. So in older organisations, sometimes that organisation was a separate charity that functioned with its own rules, its own governance, its own particular things that it was interested in doing. Uh, which is the true at the Orange Tree where I used to work, at the Opera House um, and lots of other organisations. It became a sort of the preserve of people who really cared about it to deliver something extra. And this is both a, a joy but can also be a hindrance because people have a really long established love and connection with the memberships that they have. But also that means if you change any of the benefits or anything changes, it can be emotionally hard for uh, members and supporters to understand and to accept that. Right, uh, so 68% mm, of you have one to five memberships, six to 10, 24%, and 5% of you can't remember off the top of your head how many you've got. So that's good to see. Um, oh, sorry, I've gone far too fast there. So why do people want to become members? For you, for the fundraiser, it's about uh, income, it's about developing audience, it's about developing supporters. But why for them? What's really important to the people who want to become members? It's really important to understand their why. And the priority, uh, priority booking, early access is a really key driver for people when they ask them why they decided to become members. So why do they join priority booking? It's supporting an organisation they love. It's about some of the benefits that they get associated with that. So it might be access to exhibitions, access, uh, access to rehearsals, the membership, the sharing of information and being involved in an organisation they care about. In a lot of ways, I think we need to think about members as like football fans. It is about a fan relationship. They really care. They are really involved. They're really engaged in what the organisation and the company is involved in. For many of these people, it's, you know, it's their fun, it's their leisure, it's what they love to do. Your members are your biggest fans, but then with that, they also can be your biggest critics because they love you so much and they will definitely tell you when you are doing things that they do not approve of. So a quick, how do they find out about membership? And obviously it's important to be able to tell people that there is the opportunity to be a member, to join uh, the circle. I love this one at Kew Gardens. I think it is the most extreme uh, form of kind of membership advertising. This is the ladies lose at Kew Gardens. So the full frontal of the toilet door is about becoming a member. And I think sometimes we can be quite subtle uh, in arts organisations, obviously with the uh, ever ongoing negotiation between selling tickets and selling memberships with our colleagues across the organisation and advertising the shows that we're doing. But the blatancy of a, a whole loo door um, I'm not sure I've seen in any theatre, arts organisation or museum. Uh, but also, what are the subtle ways that we do it through adverts, through back of loo doors, uh, rather than whole doors, adverts in the programme, um, making it really obvious on the website that these tickets are only able to be booked by people who are members and highlighting and encouraging people at that point to become members and join. And when they join, it's really important that they get a great welcome. And what that welcome is obviously um, depends on your organisation and what's part of that pack. I recently joined SOFI, which is the Showcase of Fundraising Innovation and Inspiration, which uh, is all about fundraising uh, history and best practice. But I got a little poster, I got a little badge, but I also got um, a handwritten note just to say welcome. And we're really glad you're a member. 
So some of these really small touches can mean a lot to people and it makes you fit them feel like they really care. With other organisations, you have postcards, you have uh, welcome packs, you have tote bags, you have badges. It's all about making people feel connected and welcome as they join. And what they really care about is the organisation. So making sure that your magazines bring that behind the scenes information uh, to them, that they get the casting information, they get the preview information, they get the priority booking, they get to see the things that they love and care about. And if that's the artist that they support or the, um, the theatre maker, they want to go behind the scenes and really have that knowledge. So using all of the communications that are part of that membership piece to really uh, bring them closer to the organisation. And then I think one of the challenges for uh, memberships within an arts and cultural organisation is this sort of messy middle that we find ourselves in between this really transactional side of the membership of I pay my £50 a year and I get 10% off here and I get tickets for this and I get tickets for that and it being a very functional relationship that is just about the benefits that people are getting and then you have the tension between that philanthropic social I love you I love um, I love Monet and therefore I want to you know see everything that is part of this exhibition and be really really involved so you have this real kind of mixture between it and if you ask people when you do a sort of survey about ask people why they've become members it is a real blend between that of I get the stuff I want to get um, and I love the organisation um, and I think for most arts and cultural organisations but not all membership sits within fundraising and development for some organisations it does sit within marketing and that obviously moves it slightly more along that line to being more transactional um, and the challenge we have with the sort of exclusiveness of making sure we deliver the benefits to our friends and with that, I just want to reflect on, you know, that social, uh, that transactional and philanthropic thing. What do friends do? Friends, we go out for dinner, we send them flowers on their birthday, we send them silly cat gifts, we send them birthday cards. So we do mirror a lot of these things in the relationships that we have with friends and supporters. Um, probably not to the same extent, um, but it's a very, it's a slightly complicated relationship in that way, because if, you know, if Dominic came round to my house for dinner, I wouldn't present him with a bill at the end to say, right, well, you've had uh, three glasses of wine and uh, you had some extra cheese, so that will be £75. Um, it's not, it's, it's that odd mixture between that social um, and emotional relationship, but also the transactional. And I think that's sometimes where our friends and members get get sort of stuck in that lovely place because they love us so much that we are their friends and we're part of their identity but they, they struggle with it being more transactional at points. And who else are we up against when we're talking about membership and relationships that people have? People, you know, lots of people have Amazon and various other things which have an incredible level of personalization. And lots of people now expect the same sort of service that they get from a membership piece uh, as they do from Amazon and other big companies. And that brings us to a note on the language. Um, should we be calling people friends or members? Some people find that friends is quite an outdated term and they don't like it. Others think it, it speaks of the social and the connection that people have with you. You need to think about what's right for your organisation and how people relate to that membership piece. Um, there was a big thing about whether we should be uh, talking when we try and get new members, are we attracting them or are we acquiring of them? An acquisition sort of speaks of buying people and perhaps that more transactional nature of the relationship that we have if we're talking about attracting people to our membership scheme then we're we're making them fall in love with us we're evoking that kind of relationship and that connection with them um, and then retention and loyalty how are we thinking about them in the language that we use internally in so in our development departments are we thinking about them in terms of numbers and kind of glorified cash machines or are we thinking about them as our warmest and most loyal supporters that we can bring into a community and look at how we develop their connection with us and how that deepens how they are involved philanthropically. They're also the people who, who love our art forms and perhaps know more about them than we do and might have a much longer history of being involved in our organisations than we do. 
I mean, frequently we meet people who've been coming to the Coliseum since the 60s or before even the English National Opera was based in the Coliseum. And we've been based in the Coliseum since 1968. So people have a, a huge history. Um, so being able to reflect the language and the expertise language of our various art forms back to those people, whilst also recognising we've got people on a different bit of the journey who might be just falling in love with an art form and not know all of the technicalities that we're doing. So one of the things in membership is really moving people from that pure tick box exercise of it says I get 10% off at the bar, it says I get this, it says I get that, um, but to make them fall in love with the organisation and move them into that uh, heart and community space. So really looking at building a sense of belonging, of how do we use the information that we have uh, working in our organisations to share with people about the impact that their membership gives, how they're involved, what they care about within our organisations and how can we share those things with them. Um, it depends on your organisation, but you know whether it's you know behind the scenes at the theatre or something from a curator or some of the education work that your organisation is doing, being able to share and make them feel part of the identity of that organisation. Um, and Claire's on this call, so I know she's very involved in, in a lot of these projects, so well done Claire. Uh, but this is, um, this is about ICU, so how do they feel even more connected with the organisation that they care about? So how can they be almost, how are you thinking about branding them that they're walking around wearing a t-shirt that says, you know, National Theatre is great, uh, Museum of Scotland is brilliant. How do they feel even more connected? So those physical things that are part of of their membership and part of an identity as a group of members. I mean, it can be as simple as, as badges or things that just bring them closer together. And it's about activating their identity and kind of creating them as a movement in themselves. Uh, you've got a funny picture here of a foot in the door. So there is a thing called the Benjamin Franklin technique, which is about just asking something, someone to do something really small for you that just allows you to keep asking them to do something bigger. So in at the moment, uh, English National Opera, we did, um, obviously everyone knows that the Arts Council removed us from the portfolio in November, and we've been uh, fighting against that decision. And one of the big things that we did was asking our supporters to sign a petition it, against, that, against that decision uh, to the Secretary of State. Uh, Secretary of State's changed twice since then. Uh, but looking at asking people to do other things other than just supporting them, but being part of an identity and a, a movement. Um, and the starfish uh, comes from a story about an old man who walked along the beach. One day after a storm, he saw a, a, a lady on the beach who was uh, reaching down in the sand and throwing starfish back into the ocean. Uh, and he said, why, why are you throwing them back in? Um, you know, the sun, the tide's going out, uh, there's thousands of them, you're never going to make a difference. Um, you, the, and the lady said, well, it'll make a difference for this one. And then he started joining in and then lots of other people started joining in. And that's the sort of kind of cascade of movement and identity to, to bring to supporters, to think about the other ways that members can be involved and be your champions and your advocates because they are your most enthusiastic people. So how else can they be helping to uh, throw starfish back in the sea to send a message to other people about what's so special about what you're doing and why? So the other thing, again, gift aid, without gift aid and VAT implications or very mindfully of gift aid and VAT implications, how can you steward them and love them and make them feel that connection. So there's part of it in terms of the communications in the membership magazines in e-newsletters, but it's what else can you do that makes their engagement with them feel special. Uh, and there's a few examples here. Uh, in the top, you've got a picture of the Coliseum. And what we do is every time a member, a member joins, they get a card on their seat for that first visit after they've been, uh, after they've joined. But also at the start of every season, we do a welcome back to the season. We're so grateful. Thank you very much for being a friend. So it's it's you know, low cost. It's a bit of time and a bit of organisation, but it makes the members feel really special and connected 
to the organisation and what we're doing. Um, we've got some examples here from the Royal Opera House from the 60th uh, year uh, anniversary of the Friends of Covent Garden. I'm a friend of Covent Garden, uh, so I went along with my family. So just being able to have an open day and a celebration to say thank you specifically to members and what we can do to just make them feel that connection. Uh, we've got a picture up here of some cards uh, which are written from a rehearsal room. So we looked at doing a special thankathon day, which thanked all of our supporters, but also that making the members a core part of that. So they got a card and or a call from someone in the organisation to say thank you for their support. How can you recognise their anniversaries of being a member and reinforce that long term connection that they've got with your organisation? There's uh, some academic research that shows that if you um, refer to how long someone's been a member in your renewal letters, it just uh, increases the retention rate because it sort of reminds people like, oh, yes, I've, I've been doing that for seven years, 10 years, 15, two years. It makes it even more relevant to them. And obviously there's a data question there because all, we've all changed CRM systems and it's sometimes tricky to get that consistency. But I think recognising that longevity of connection is a really important way to do it. So what, if you, we put it in the chat, are there any other special ways that you celebrate and thank your members and bring them closer to what you're doing that you think are brilliant or that you're going to steal from some of these ideas? And obviously within all of this, to be really mindful of the gift aid threshold and uh, what's VAT able or not, um, which is a whole other minefield, but we can talk about that in the Q&A if people have got things they really want to pick up. And who else is involved in all of this? Um, as much as we in development and fundraising uh, can think about all of these things, it's about the holistic experience that our members have in the organisation. It's when they come in the door, when they're on the phone to the box office. And it's important to kind of bring that family connection of membership and the importance of membership to all of the other colleagues that we work with, because it's no good if they have a brilliant experience with us but then um, there's that slight, probably an exaggeration, but that eye roll of, oh, it's a membership card, I can't remember how to do the discount on the box office or on the bar. So making sure that everyone in the organisation understands the importance of members as the like biggest fans and most loyal audience, but also that opportunity to just thank them for their support while they're with us in the building. So whether that's on the telephone to um, do it, we've worked to try and put it into scripts with the box office so that it's something that automatically gets sort of reminded of if they're a member, say thank you for being a member, that when they're welcomed at the bar or the box office, that their membership card is, is received with joy and engaged with, but also other people in the organisation that they're willing to share that knowledge and that space and that access for members and understanding how important it is that there is an opportunity for these people to not uh, to be part of that family and part of that story and some of the boring things that we think of or that they think of as their everyday life are incredibly fascinating for um, a member or supporter you know what kind of gloves they wear to look after the paintings or what kind of paint they're using these things are really important and being able to to be in the front of house briefing to talk to uh, ushers and, and staff about membership and why it's important uh, so it doesn't get lost in the mix of development are always asking for these things for these funny people and we don't quite know why. So being able to really make sure that the whole experience is really important. And obviously there are things that are outside of our control, which obviously come back to us about you. Know, the temperature of the theatre wasn't right last night and you know, um, or they didn't like the show. But the things that we can control that make it feel that they're even more part of the family are really important. Um, and then there's the big question of new versus old. Um, and I think particularly what we're seeing in the cost of living crisis with, you know, some people not renewing all of their memberships or looking at what levels they're doing. It's really important to look at how we love and keep those loyal uh, members who've been with us a long time and just trying to keep that kind of community and information sharing and that they feel really loved and supported. And we can go into big complicated things about how we find new customers and how we attract them. Uh, but it's, it's, well, it's more costly to get new members 
they're you know it's then you have to think about how you retain them and build build them uh, but the loyal once you've got someone in as a member it's really important that their experience is really good because then you've got uh, more chance of developing that relationship um, and here are just a few lovely things uh, I thought was worth sharing about why people um, are supporting ENO as members so just the different things that are important to them and I think that really interesting thing about it being important to know the why for your audience because for each venue theatre gallery um, the, the why will be very different but knowing that why and being able to feed it back into people in their communications you know I you know we know members love supporting opera or keeping the company going so being able to use that language back to the friends and supporters that you're talking to is really important and then oh okay so can we have poll number four please rosario so this is a just a quick question about what things do you measure with your membership um so you can fill that in so I think we, we talk about uh, fundraising being both an art and a science and it, it's in the creative industries we're really lucky that we can talk about, uh, we can do really creative and interesting things uh, and we've got great content to share with our members and involve them in what they're doing. But also the data side of it is really important to understand what's working, what's not working, um, where we're seeing movement or not seeing movement. So in that way data is your friend. Um, and looking at why people are joining, how people are joining, looking at how to collaborate with other bits of the organisation um, in terms of things like membership journeys online and can you do a, a hot jar poll, um, which is literally like a tiny pop up that comes up as soon as someone's joined to say, why did you join as a member today and getting quick um, answers so that you're getting more insight and data on what's working and what's not. Looking at how people are using that membership piece, are they going through? Um, I'm going to share the results of that so you can see. Um, there's a lot of a lot of ways that that we we are doing it and and looking at at what that membership uh, piece means and how we're measuring it. And then obviously we try and look at how we can uh, upgrade people or downgrade people um or whether they're stuck and actually quite often we see lots of people join at one level and then really really never leave that level that they've been involved in for for years and years or decades but then also um as dominic will talk about in the next uh, session how do we use the people we've got as members and look at how they could become more deeply philanthropically involved and so we have many of you will have seen this of just you know a donor pyramid and a wedge so it starts at the bottom we've got a lot a lot of people they might give you one-off donors and then about in the middle is where membership sits it's people who are committed to making regular uh regular gifts and supporting your organization um and as this is part of a, a series of four workshops we'll be talking about major gifts and uh, the final session plan giving or legacies at the end but looking at sort of recognizing the the amount so it's, it's lots of people giving a lot of uh, small gifts but that that's really important and the sort of the ancillary spend that they have with you it's not just about the spend that comes into your development line but it's also the box office income the food and beverage income the other spend they make within your organization is really important to recognize as well Great, so that's, uh, we're going to pause now for some questions and I'll stop sharing the slides so we can, well, you can see me and Dominic, I don't think we can see you. So, so we've had lots of questions come in already, thank you very much, feel free to keep those coming in through either the, the Q&A or the chat, I can pick up both. The first um, question uh, we've had come in is about managing big changes to a friend scheme or a membership scheme, so where one might change prices. Um, or change benefits, or add or remove tiers, um, and how uh, one might manage that. Um, yeah, manage that most positively. I guess. Yeah, uh, and I think it's a really 
sensitive issue with a lot of members and supporters. I know in previous organisations that what we ended up doing sometimes is almost having a secret level that we knew that there was like one or two supporters who really loved their slightly niche um, one. So it's about retiring certain levels perhaps and keeping them as a secret um, for a particular people. Uh, it's, I suppose it's an honest assessment of what benefits are we delivering, what are being used, what, are, what do they cost us to deliver both in terms of time and money. How does that impact on gift aid and VAT that we're able to claim? If it jeopardises the gift aid that we could claim on the membership um, or we're getting near that threshold, how do we uh, assess that and look at what we can do? And I think it's about focus groups and listening to some of the uh, members as well and saying, uh, being really open that you about the reasons why you need to change things and being able to have a narrative about that journey uh, and being able to focus group perhaps, you know, we're looking at it looking like this, we'd love your feedback and really involving them in the process of how you're shaping it. And then also I think there is probably the painful bit of accepting, you know, actually in 1985 you used to get the moon and, you know, the stars and with the current situation with our Arts Council funding, with the cost of living crisis, with the rising cost of MDF to make sets and things, everything just does cost more money and we can't do what we used to do and being able to have that in a in a clear narrative for the organization about the justification for those changes i think we were with the pandemic there were obviously moments where we would say oh you used to have access to this thing but now because we need to keep our artists safe we can't have donors and artists in the same space so i think people do understand if they have a clear narrative and an understanding of the why these things are changing um, and if there are and there will be pain points and there probably is the, the, the bit where you know you're going to have to have awkward conversations with some of the people who are fixated on, on the one benefit and they're the only person who takes it up. So I think it's about dialogue and having the time to, to have that really clear narrative. Yeah, I think um, Marina said it earlier, but remember that your friends and members are probably the people that love you most and that might may have been with you the longest. And so I think if you're able to be really honest about why you're making changes, you'll you'll bring them along with you, particularly if you can, you know, um, have quite specific examples. So we know the cost of our productions are rising massively as the cost of wood goes up because there's a lot of wood in um, theatrical and operatic scene. Uh, scenery so using those statistics kind of makes people understand it a bit more and, and gets them kind of behind the scenes which they like um i also think when you're making significant changes to a membership or a, or a friend scheme adding in some churn is okay too knowing that you're not going to please everyone and that if you make these changes some people may leave you and that would be a real shame but if in the bigger picture that increases your income increases the size of your membership etc um then you have to factor that churn in and that's okay you're you're not keeping everyone is okay. Um, we had a question about if you see someone giving uh, from Alexandra asks if you see someone giving sporadically, but they're not a member, how would you get them involved in a membership program? Yeah, it, I think this is a tricky one because it, you, you can kind of go well, on one hand, they're giving you money, isn't that brilliant? And they're supporting you and being involved and membership isn't for everyone. And certain people are very driven by the particular benefits of a membership package and they might almost feel that it makes their relationship too transactional and they prefer to give you money as and when and support you by coming to things and spending money on things um in which case that's lovely um i think you know it it might be worth a phone call you know just ring them up and say you know we've seen you we think you'd really get so much more out of your relationship with uh, XYZ organization by being a member because you would get this information behind the scenes you know with, is that something you're interested in and if not trying to understand why they're not interested in it it might be that despite all your wonderful marketing and you know direct mail campaigns and emails and posters on toilet doors they've just never seen it or never thought about it or it might be because they think it's they prefer to not to be um, or the people have a very kind of Sort of in their mental accounting of how they think about things well, i'm a member here and i'm a member there but i'm not a member there so they might just have put you in a different category but they're supporting you which is also fantastic yeah great um yeah i would just reinforce that direct contact piece get in touch with them um understand why they're giving 
He had a question about recovering lost members, members lost during the pandemic particularly, and how we might encourage those members to come back to us. Yeah, and I think this is, it's a really interesting thing. When we did the Thankathon uh, in September, we had members of the orchestra, the chorus, the board, um, music staff, all sorts of people from the organisation ringing up and saying thank you to supporters who'd supported, and that did include some people who had lapsed during the pandemic. And one thing we found um, was a lot of people had got older during the pandemic and stopped coming out and stopped buying tickets and stopped and weren't ready to come back to the theatre yet. And there is quite a sort of missing audience piece there in terms of age, demographic, ageing, changing behaviour, which really still, it hasn't come back in the, in the full strength and also people just got older. Um, so I think it's thinking about other ways that they can be involved um, and also with cost of living and people being on fixed incomes with pensioners, particularly um, those things that are pinching more. So I think it's, it's again, um, if you can find the capacity within the team to ring them and understand that it's really important because also then you can cross them off the list if they tell you that, you know, uh, no, now we're 85, we've stopped going to the theatre or we go once in a while, but we're not being members at the moment. It's also looking at what other opportunities you might have to stay in touch with them that doesn't that don't exist through a formal membership thing, because sometimes people who've been members for a long time might be stopping coming, but they might be good prospects for occasional gifts for legacy gifts as well. And I think as soon as people stop having a, a ticket booking record or a membership booking record, they sort of disappear from our minds, um, but we don't disappear from their hearts necessarily. So thinking about are there any other ways that you can stay in touch with them in a very light way so that if circumstances change or in a long term uh, thinking about a legacy, it might be something that people want to consider. Great. Uh, we had a lot of chat about paperless. Um, so both if one is sending out hard copy welcome packs and regular letters, etc., how one manages any concerns from members about environmental issues. Um, and then equally how we stay personal once we've already gone paperless. So if an organization decided it's paperless, how one stays personal. Um, and then maybe the third piece is about um, any examples of the personal approach going too far, and becoming a bit creepy. <laughs> um, so in terms of environmental, I think it's really if your CRM system is able to, to be able to give someone an option of how they want to have that communication and that relationship with you, because some people uh, do want to, obviously, um, with Brexit and trying to send membership magazines abroad, there are all sorts of complications about um, those things as well. So actually being able to say, you know, uh, all of us uh, uh, that have Arts Council funding in some form have a sustainability and probably anyway ethically would have a sustainability uh, desire to go more paper free. Um, so being able to offer that to people at the beginning that they don't need a physical membership card or they don't need the magazine um, because it will also save you costs, but also to keep in line with those values. I think it's really important not to forget those people who still aren't digital. We still have a swathe of members who are very long standing members who are not on email and still rely on paper. So if you have gone paperless, just that there may be a small section that still needs something printed out and that your snazzy, you know, uh, stop press now, sell your granny for a ticket announcements going out on email are not necessarily reaching those people because they're going to pick it up in a newspaper in a couple of days time when something is announced and then feel slighted. So there is a recognition that it is not for everyone. I think there's still a lot of evidence that uh, direct mail and physical paper is receiving more return on investment in terms of ticket booking, in terms of appeals and fundraising, that still that tangible, there is something in my hand that I have, mm -hmm. um, it is having a better return on investment than just pure emails. I think with personalization, obviously it's, you know, the, the worst thing when I'm sure we've all received one where it's, you know, dear salutation um, and that making sure the data is clean, that you are looking after the people that's there. Um, I'm trying to think if I can think of when it's gone too far. I mean, I think our, our friends and supporters do get very close to the people that they work with and they know them. Um, obviously, some of our members and supporters have uh, multiple relationships, so it's not just with the fundraising team or with one part of the organisation. They might be volunteers. 
and coming in and therefore privy to other information or involved. So I think it's uh, it's about that, I suppose, the elegant professional relationship that we have with our supporters that, you know, they are not our personal friends, um, but being able to share openly and professionally what is going on with an organisation and how they can be involved and how they can support, but not um, not expecting them, well, we're not expecting flowers on our birthday and that, that probably would become a bit creepy mm -hmm. if, if that was happening and I, I hope that's not. Um, yeah, and I think there's that balance too of making sure that our members feel really close to the people that are administrating their membership in the development team, um, but also that they have more than one touch point so that if that person moves on from the organisation, the organisation retains that, that member or that friend, obviously. Um, Ruby has asked about moving from uh, an annual uh, direct debit to a monthly direct debit option um, and any advice or experiences on how that can affect acquisition or retention. I think it can be very attractive because obviously it's a smaller amount um, to start with and it's, uh, you know, lots of little things. It's much easier to think, oh, it's just a few pounds a month rather than what the big number is. And I think it can help move people up the ladder and go up to another membership level if you were paying 150 in a one-off and then you were being asked to move someone to 20 pounds a month um it feels less even though it's you know it's 240 so it's uh that's really important i think one of the challenges can be if you have a blockbuster moment or a show uh coming up and people are paying on direct debit there you can see people just joining up and kind of going oh i'll pay five pounds a month and now i've got my tickets for this super show I'm going to cancel it. So I think there is something in that and some organisations don't let people do it in the first year so that they kind of prove their loyalty and that they are invested. Uh, but also it's if, you, if you're concerned about that, making sure you've got something to monitor it and that the, the challenge comes of, oh, those tickets to that thing were only valid for members and you joined up for a, a month and a half and paid uh, one instalment or in some cases no instalment and then cancelled it. Um, so it does have pitfalls as well. Um, and it's the systems that you can put in place to help that. Right. Thank you, Marina. And um, we've had some feedback from Ella and Hannah that they've had great um, feedback from members when they have retained um, things like membership cards that move to a more sustainable product. So moving to paper, for example, with those cards, donors still want to feel something in their hand. Um, so we have a question about um, advice for promoting a more philanthropic scheme rather than a benefits led scheme. Um, I think there'll be a lot of moving to a more philanthropic mindset in our session next week when we look at um, look at major donor attraction. But is there anything, Marina, that you wanted to cover in a um, philanthropic membership program? I mean, I think it probably depends where you're starting because some organisations sort of have uh, the benefit no, have never had a benefit based scheme. Um, so I think it depends where your organisation is. And I think sometimes it's about offering another product in the membership suite, as it were, that is just about a philanthropic support that might be at a lower level, rather than thinking about it in a major gift space. But is there um, a, a benefit one? I, when I worked at the Orange Tree, there was uh, something very much about previews, and you've got a kind of preview club membership, which got you two for one on the first night. And then there was one that was even more benefits, slightly more money. And then there was one that was just a, I just want to support you because I like what you do and I want to get the newsletter. So is there a space for a low level benefit light version of what you're doing as well as something more transactional uh, for people, I think would be worth exploring uh, within the options. And I think caveating, caveating that with the danger of then you can end up with just too many things on the table and people have that kind of paralysis of I don't know what kind of membership I want because there's like 57 different ones and you know all I want is you know I want, I want some tickets and I want to be able to come to the rehearsal or whatever it is um, and having too many options can sort of uh, make people freeze and not make any kind of decision about what the right kind of membership is for them or that you end up with three people on this membership scheme and then you've got to remember that oh yes we promised everyone on the tea circle has got to have a cup of tea when they come into the theatre. So you end up with benefits that either you don't have the time or capacity to deliver or, or aren't really serving that uh, membership relationship. I think one thing that might come up um, and is seen in some things 
uh, a lot of kind of subscription box uh, systems have a kind of stop start um, thing where you can take a break for a month or two or um, we have a gym box that comes and you can turn it off for a, a period of time or you can say you don't want it and I think there is a move perhaps with some memberships that that might happen I think it's more tricky particularly in a sort of theatre season way or a gallery season where it's linked to certain access to things and then gift aid and VAT to stop and start those things the other thing that people are exploring is a sort of modulated you know make your own benefit system choose your own adventure uh, of you know I want priority booking and I want dress rehearsals and I want to support the organization but also I really want x and that somehow magically through CRM systems yet to be invented that that would de deliver and develop a package for you specifically but then again I think you would need to have like a super trusted CRM system that would then be able to help you automate what you needed for all of those slightly different people of you know well Dominic only likes newsletters about opera singers but Marina wants opera singers and theatre and you know Rosario wants you know all of those things and six other things so how do we make that work and I saw a question in the chat about promoting on social media uh, yeah. and promoted adverts uh, yes um, yes we've done it I've done it before it's sometimes quite hard to get the analytics back to see how successful it was I think one of the challenges can be that you need so much if you're going a big blanket approach you need so much data you need thousands and thousands and thousands of names or you have a very niche thing where you put in everyone on your database and their email addresses and it just targets those people versus targeting lookalikes so it can be quite costly um, and not necessarily have a lot of benefit I think what's what has been seen to work more successfully is organic posts from your organization that are boosted so it's very cheap it's a cheaper way of doing it but people who are already in your orbit have that boosted so it's paying like a small amount to have it kind of pop up a little bit more rather than a, a wide more broad brush uh, approach because i think generally with arts and culture our, our audiences are a bit more niche than the entirety of facebook but also i think it's looking at the segments of each social media platform and what their standard audience is and how that reflects different bits of your audience. I'd say, you know, in terms of membership piece, probably Facebook would be the right kind of audience in terms of age and demographic. You've got on Twitter, you've got a kind of a super, super, super geeky level of, of people and support who probably already are our members and connected in a different way and have a very different kind of interaction with the organization on Twitter. And again, a very different on Instagram and LinkedIn. So I think it's looking at the different platforms and the um, ethos and, and demographics of those people. And the sort of tied in question is about maximising the visibility of one's schemes. Um, examples similar to the notes on seats, whilst also maximising gift aid. Um, I guess that might be in a, in a building based scenario, but may not be. So maybe thoughts on, on both. Um, I mean, I think the, the visibility, I think it depends yeah, on the nature of your organisation. I know at ETO, Dominic, you do some talks before shows and that you just use that as an opportunity to tell the whole audience that membership exists. And if you want to come and talk about it, I'm going to be there at the end of the show and there's someone to, to talk about it. Um, I think you need to find what test things and see what works with your organisation and your audiences. If you can put it in, if there's a speech before a show, if there's a speech before an opening, if you can get it into the customer journey, either online or as part of the visitor experience that um, quite a lot of uh, venues that oh, are now you a member, would you like to be a member today becomes part of the, the welcome and the introduction galleries are particularly good at that if you've got kind of um, exhibition access booked in baked into your membership scheme, that it's obviously a point of upselling and having that conversation. Yeah, certainly at every point at which one pays for something at the Coliseum, like a drink or merchandise, one is asked, are you a member? Yeah, are you a member? You could get 10% off if you were, you know, do. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've got a few questions about benefits. We should, we've probably got another three or four minutes here and then we should wrap up. But question about benefits that, um, so um, Rachel's asked about monitoring members' usage of their benefits. Dom asked earlier about knowing what members want from their membership um uh yeah and then there is a question about tiered membership we might come back to um but yeah so so monitoring membership usage and knowing what one what members want 
Yeah, I mean, I think it does depend on what, what the benefits are and how you're going to do it, because, for example, rehearsal tickets is a big one at ENO. People love coming to rehearsals, or a percentage of friends really love coming to rehearsals. They tend to be older, they tend to be retired, because it means it's a daytime experience. So we can see if they're using those benefits. One of the things that we have sort of uh, programmed in is if people have never been to a dress rehearsal and they've been a member a certain amount of time, to send them a specific kind of, oh, you know, don't forget that this is one of the benefits that you can be using. So that's very easy to monitor through the box office system and the data that you've got. Other things like we have a members room and people have to use their membership card to sign into that. So we get a report of who's come to that. Um, in our post-show surveys, if they're a member, there's a whole other section of questions that they get asked about their experience so that we get uh, information on whether they've used the discounts, used the members room um, or any of the other things so that we're getting a sort of segment um, so we know that what members like. I think sometimes it's tricky because people say if you ask them in a generic big survey of what do you want, they'll say they want everything. Um, what do they use? They'd probably say they would use most things and some of them are hard to, to track uh, what, what they're using or not. But I think it's really important to, to find the ones you can and work with other colleagues across the organisation to see what is being used and how it's being used and how, in again, going back to that personalisation, if you can see that lots of people have never been to an exhibition after joining the thing, can you send them a more personal reminder and say, oh, it's great, we hope you're getting the best out of your membership this year. We noticed you haven't been again. You know, we'd love to see you at X. We've got X coming up. So being able to segment the data and being able to create a sort of more bespoke reaction to people who aren't using the benefits that they could use um, and other people you know the benefits are just like extra nice to things to have but they're really happy because they're just supporting you and being involved great thanks marina that brings us up to five two so we should probably go back to the slides and begin wrapping up yep uh, okay There we go. So this is part one of a four week series. So next week we have engaging major donors beyond patrons uh, and then the week after giving groups and syndicates for arts and cultural organisations and finishing with building a legacy fundraising programme. So we're moving all the way up that donor pyramid from the members of the thing go all the way up to the top. Um, so I know many of you have signed up already, but we do hope you'll join Dominic and I for the next couple of weeks as we go through those sessions as we are Arts Council funded. Uh, there is a survey that uh, Culture Sector Network and Chartered Institute of Fundraising need everyone or as many people as possible, please do fill in the survey. Rosario will be sending it round. The session today has been filmed and it will be shared on the Culture Sector Network uh, YouTube channel. Again, you'll get a link with that uh, to show you more. And I thought just wrap up with some final kind of thoughts on uh, membership and making the most of it. And it's really important to remember the why for your members, why they love you, why they feel connected. Make them part of the family. They are supporting you because they love you. They love what you do. They love your organisation. So find ways that you can make them part of that community, part of the family. Share what you can share with them about backstage access or gallery access or everything else. Deliver what you promise. If you've got a list of benefits, make sure you're delivering it because there will be a section of them that have the list and are asking, da, 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 da. oh no, we didn't get this, we didn't get this. So if you've got a list of benefits, make sure you can deliver them and you are. Data is your friend, track what's working, track what's not working, uh, use that data to inform how you develop and look after your members. Share the passion. If you, most of us working in arts and cultural organisations are really passionate about the art forms that we work in, the places where we work. Bring that to your relationship with your members and say thank you. Uh, find other way, find, thank them for joining, thank them for renewing, thank them when they're in the building, find ways that the whole organisation says thank you for that. Because again, it's not just the, the bit of income that comes into the development pot, it's that wider organisational uh, ticket income food and beverage, they are part of that family. So make sure you say thank you. And don't sort of take them out of segments of other ways that they could be asked to give. So keep asking them to support, whether that's small, low level appeals. Um, and Dominic will talk next week uh, about different ways to, to take them higher up that pyramid and that journey. 
but think about other ways you can ask them to support as volunteers, um, as low level donors on small campaigns and appeals, uh, but keep them involved because they are your loveliest and loyalist supporters. So thank you everyone and uh, that's it for today and we'll see you next week.